Hey, hey, don't go away. Where are you going? Uh, please uh, find your way to your seats uh, and that. Uh, we have to, uh, I've got the law right here at my side in case we need to, uh, anybody, you know, move in quickly. So uh, this is Officer Scott Baker. Scott, come here. And, and Scott has been working with the World Food Prize for 15 years. Uh, yeah. And, not, and, and uh, takes care of our building, uh, the Hall of Laureates. He's here for all of our events, and we are so fortunate to have a relationship with the Des Moines Police Department through him, and um, he's, just, he's part of the family. So I wanted you to know, and thank you, Scott, for all that you do for us. Thank you. <clears throat> Should restart that. Now, so now the, uh, to get everybody's eyes open and your blood flowing, we have a wonderful, but for me a bit bittersweet uh, moment. Uh, Gordon Conway has been a member of our Council of Advisors for about 15 years plus. I met him at the symposium. I heard him talk for about a minute and I said, I've got to have him on our Council of Advisors <clears throat> and have convinced him, and he has been such an incredible source of wisdom for me. And this he's now stepping back from being on our council and uh, is, uh, but is going to always remember, be a member of the World Food Prize family. So this is his valedictory uh, from the World Food Prize. He's, the title of his remarks are An Agricultural Ecologist Journey. So here, Gordon Conway is an incredible, iconic figure. A young man, he goes to Cambridge, gets a PhD at California Davis, and goes off to Borneo in Malaysia in the early 1960s and begins this journey. Somebody's gonna make a movie, uh, Gordon, of you. I don't know who gonna be playing you, but, <clears throat> and, and takes him to India, to Africa with the Ford Foundation, president of the Rockefeller Foundation, um, president of the Royal Geographic Society, Royal Society Fellow, is an Imperial College, uh, is scientific advisor to DFID, in the UK government, uh, is Knight Commander, uh, uh, invested by Her Majesty, and has set the agenda with his books, The Doubly Green Revolution and One Billion, Can We Feed uh, a Hungry World? And so, like Dr. Borlaug, who gave his 60 years of fighting hunger address, this, this is a moment for Sir Gordon to give his remarks and to share with all of us what that journey has been about. So he's going to come up and do that. And, and then, because I thought there might be some questions, uh, another extremely distinguished member of our Council of Advisors, Ismail Sarageldin, will be here and they will continue with a uh, fireside chat we were almost going to have a fire because it was so cold a couple of days ago and it was snowing. But uh, they'll be here and continue that conversation. Ismail Sarageldin is like Gordon Conway. He was uh, head of the CGIR system, vice president of the World Bank, the uh, founding director of the Biblioteca Alexandrina. He's the emeritus librarian of Alexandria. And I think if you were to say, who are the two uh, premier top international development specialists in the world today? Their names would be right at the top of the list. So let me welcome Sir Gordon Conway and Ismail Sarageldin. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken, very much for those words of introduction. 
Uh, I'm delighted to be on this stage with my good friend Ismail, and we're going to have a chat as you gather later on. I'm just going to start with uh, some of the um, things that, of my life that I thought you'd be interested to see. Uh, I've got a... I didn't pick it up. She's getting it. It's a little machine. It's my own private robot. Okay. Uh, the title's slightly changed, but there it is. When I was nine years old, that's when it really started, I was taken out into our school playground by our teacher, and she threw a quadrat onto the grass. A quadrat is an ecological tool, and what we all had to do was to get on our hands and knees and look at the different things we could see, the kind of different grasses and flowers and everything else. And I got excited because I found a ladybird, and I said, I've got a ladybird, she's very good, she said. And that was my beginning. It was from then on, and believe it or not, the kids used to call me an ecologist, my fellow kids from then onwards. And I always tell this story when I go to schools and give addresses, because I always like to say this and say, you teachers, you know what you can do. Anyway, my first job was uh, in Borneo. I went there, I was about 23 years old, and uh, I was the, the entomologist for the whole country. And uh, when I got there, the director said to me, um, we want you to go over to the East Coast because we've got problems with our cocoa. So I went over to the East Coast and they're growing the cocoa under the secondary forest that's grown up, they cut down the main trees, they've got the other trees. But as you can see, on the right, that's what the cocoa looked like. Hadn't got a leaf on it. Uh, thousands of hectares were like that. And um, there were pests that were causing that damage. One of them called a bagworm. You can see up in the top left, it's a, it's a little caterpillar that covers itself with the leaf that it eats. So it's protected by this leaf and it walks around under the leaf. And another one was called the ringbark borer, which was a, a caterpillar there that manages to go all the way around the tree. And of course, it kills the tree. And there were other pests too. But one of the things I noticed was that there were parasites too. I really was trained as an entomologist. And so you can see two of those parasites there. And I thought, that's significant, we've got the parasites there. I decided that probably what was happening was that the spraying with the pesticides, which you can see here, if you see all, all those pluses in 1961, they're Endrin, Dildrin, DDT, BHC, And they were spraying them. They, when I talked to the planters, they said, oh, we're doing a great job. They said, we spray at least twice a week with mixtures of all of those. And you, know, and you just think, today you look at that and think, it's, but don't forget, even Rachel Carson's Silent Spring hadn't been written then. She didn't write it until 1962. That's what they were doing. And it just seemed to me that all that spraying was killing all the parasites. And so I decided we had to stop spraying. And I got the director of agriculture to come and see me, and he came over and looked all around, and I said, we've got to stop the spraying. He said, that's all right, I'll do that. And so he issued a decree, it was a sort of Trumpian era, in which you could actually say, <laughs> stop all spraying. And everybody did it, they stopped all spraying. And you can see on the right there, the uh, spraying was stopped except for a very selective pesticide called triclophon at the bottom that killed the bagworms. And that's what happened to the pests. You can see by the middle of 1962, all the pests had come under control, and that lasted for nearly 40 years. It was one of the first examples, really, of integrated pest management. Uh, it had been done before, as many of you know, in, um, in California, 
with um, alfalfa and also in Peru with cotton. But basically what I did then was the only other example of integrated pest management. Uh, when I was at Davis, I basically learned about mathematics and computing. That's really why I went to Davis in those days. And um, one of the bits of work I did was with a colleague, a professor at the university, on Aedes aegypti. Aedes aegypti, you all know, carries yellow fever. It carries a, an awful disease called ngong gong, where all your knees uh, seize up. But it also carries Zika virus, and that's how all of you know it these days, because Zika's come back. And we went to Dar es Salaam, the two of us, and you, we went into a used car dump where there were tires with water in them where the mosquitoes were breeding. And we sat there like this. So the mosquitoes came to feed on us, right? We caught the mosquitoes and we either put them in uh, on our ears or on our knuckles and so they could have a good meal. So we had a full meal, right? And then we marked every single mosquito that we caught with a very fine hair, with a paint, different paint colors on the back of the mosquito, we marked every single one. And over three weeks, 12% of the mosquitoes that we marked came back, which was very high. And we discovered that they came to feed every four days. And yellow fever and Zika and other viruses take about um, seven days to mature inside the mosquito before they can be passed on to uh, a human being. And so you've got to go through two cycles uh, for the mosquito to be able to pass the yellow fever on. And actually you can easily work out, I did a paper about all of this, if you've got about a 50% uh, an insecticide that kills about 50% of the mosquitoes, you get rid of it virtually altogether over that time. It was a very good example of learning about uh, modern mathematical models applied to a particular problem. I then, however, decided I was going to spend much more of my time not on big computer models or even analytical models, but on, as it were, conceptual models. And this is a conceptual model. It's a diagram of a rice field with all the different elements in the rice field, called an agroecosystem. But what is interesting about it is that I've deliberately included human beings in the diagram. Right? So there's, a, there's an ecological, physical boundary around the system. But there's also a socio-economic boundary around it. And that together creates an agroecosystem. And that system, and I've used this in lots of other examples, is the basis for acquiring information and then building up your understanding of what's going on. And a lot of what I did was with farmers. In that sense, I've got some kinship way back there with Norm Borlaug. By the way, Norm was just starting on his career when I was 10 years old, uh, learning about ecology. And so the, the interaction between farmers and people is very important. This is not exactly the ideal way in which um, experts should be talking to farmers. I was much more interested in what, finding out what farmers know. And one of the most remarkable things that happened to me was in Ethiopia. Uh, four years after the Great Famine, I sat down with some farmers. We sat down for two hours and I got them to work out the number of days of rain each month for the previous 10 years. Quite extraordinary. It, it worked primarily because in those days the land was being allocated each year to somebody different. So they could remember they were on that area there that year, they were there over there. And they'd say, oh yes, I remember that September when I was there. There were probably about three or four days of rain. And that's what happened. And so you've got this fantastic piece of information there out of farmers' minds. And of course, you can see the drought year, no rain whatsoever. That one was easy to fill in. And 
I and uh, a number of other people um, started working on getting farmers to draw maps and diagrams. And you can see on the left there is a map of a, uh, a farm area, a village, and they've, made, they've used different colour powders. And they've even brought some of the plants to stick in the ground. And you can actually, if you're, you look hard, you can see there's a hill in the middle of the diagram. And you can see the real hill in the background there. And then you find ways in which farmers themselves can describe their way of life. And so, for example, that woman there, she's got 12 little stones for each month of the year. And she's looking using little uh, seeds and pebbles to indicate, I think in this case, it's numbers of days of weeding. So you've got models that farmers can use to communicate with you. Sometimes they're a bit ephemeral. And here's, here's some farmers, I think in Haryana, um, they've drawn a, a map of their environment of the watershed where they live. And they've used colored powder and chalk to delineate, delineate different parts of the, of the uh, environment. What is significant is that bottom right-hand picture, the farmers on the left, the person on the ground sitting, arguing with them, debating with them, is the chief conservator of forests for the whole state of, of Haryana. And that's a, that's a dramatic transformation of the way in which farmers and experts speak to each other. And you can go further, and here, for example, some uh, villagers, they've done their own map, they've described the map, and in the bottom right, they've got a list of all the things they want to have done, order by priority. So you can take these things all the way through. And that gets you quite a long way, but it doesn't get you all the way. Because first of all, they've got all these ideas here, but you need to ask, are their ideas sustainable? What they recommend, what they'd like to do, is it going to be sustainable? And that opens a whole big area of discussion. First of all, what is sustainable agriculture? And I know in this room, all of you will decide it's this and this and this and that, not this and no. So it, it's okay, gluten-free foods are in, but GM crops are out or, or whatever it is. So we all believe that. But in fact, you can have a much more precise definition of sustainability. I used to think I'd invented the term sustainable agriculture because I actually ran workshops on sustainable agriculture in the 70s in Indonesia and the Philippines. Then I discovered that I was really a a latecomer to the idea. There's a man called Varro, a Roman called Varro in the first century BC. And he, like me, was 80 years old and he married again. That, that's not been my case, but it, it is in his case. <laughs> and um, he thought, well, I'll give my wife, my new wife, my new lovely young wife, I'll give her a book to describe how she should run the estate. And so you can read it. It's in Latin, but you've got English translations, and, and it's, it's available now everywhere, and you can sit and read what he gave her as advice. And there's a wonderful passage in there which I've described. He talks about agriculture not only being an art, but an important art, and it's also as well a science. But then, which teaches you what crops are to be planted in each kind of soil, what operations did be carried out in order that, this is the key, key bit, the land may regularly produce the largest crops. If you can just see the Latin at the top, quotera maximos perpetuo redat fructus. Quotera, that the land may um, produce uh, yield, redat fructus, maximally perpetuo, perpetuo, in perpetuity. And that's by far the best definition of sustainability that I've ever seen, and it, it lasts for me, and now it should last for everybody else. Um, there are, of course, enormous challenges to achieving sustainable agriculture. 
Uh, I've got a book coming out next year with my colleagues Usman Bajan and Katrin Glatzel called uh, Food for All in Africa. And we've got a whole chapter on the challenges. Soil erosion is one of them. 25% of sub-Saharan African soils are seriously eroded, not just eroded, but seriously eroded. And of course, we've also in Africa got this big problem of population growth. Just look at that right-hand graph. The bright red is East Africa. The sort of purple at the bottom is West Africa. Huge population growth. And Africa is becoming highly populated by young people. And we need to intensify production. I know many people say, oh, there's plenty of food in the world, we just need to share it more evenly. I say, yes, that's true. It's like money. There's plenty of money in the world, we just need to share it more evenly. <laughs> there's just usually a few sort of obstructions in the way. We need more food, particularly in Africa. Africa imports $40 billion worth of food every year. $40 billion worth of food every year. And you can see the bottom of the graph on the right, they're only producing about one ton of maize per hectare, on average, in Africa. One ton per maize. Here in, not here, I'm not going to one place. Over there in Europe, we get about four or five, six tons. Here in Iowa, do you know what the average yield of Iowa corn is? Oh, I can't, I can't talk in bushels, I'm a Brit. Uh, so somebody said nine, it's actually 11. 11 tons per hectare is the average yield here in Iowa, compared with one in Africa. But of course the point is that the intensification that we've got to do has got to be sustainable. It means that you've got to use inputs in a very prudent way. It means you have to minimise the emissions of greenhouse gases, particularly methane and, um, and nitrous oxide, because they are very powerful greenhouse gases that come from agriculture. We have to improve the natural capital, like the soils and the water. We've got to strengthen resilience and reduce environmental impact. And that's what we call sustainable intensification. And that's what I'm passionate about. And we know what can be achieved. This is in Ethiopia. The woman there has uh, about a, a hectare of land. She has a drought-tolerant hybrid, corn. And she adds boron as well, because that's... Uh, what's missing there. And she has an appropriate blended fertilizer. In the foreground, on the left there, she's, that's just any old stuff. That's diammonium phosphate. That's what everybody loves. They always put diammonium phosphate on everything. But in the back, those great big maize plants, and you can see them behind her, have got two or three cobs per plant. And she's getting four, five, six tons per hectare. And that is not just true there, it's true around the rest of Africa. If you go to Mozambique, for example, you get the same thing, but if you add lime instead of adding uh, boron. And it's, you've got to put yourself in the mindset of a poor farmer who he and his parents and grandparents and others way, way back in distant history, have all been getting, if they're lucky, about one tonne per hectare. And he or she wakes up in the morning and they've got four, five or six tonnes. Just think about that. What a miracle that is, or apparent miracle. And I think sustainable intensification has got three approaches, really. One is ecological, one is genetic, one is socioeconomic. And I'll go through those rather quickly. First of all, the ecological is using ecological principles. You know, the principles I started to learn at the age of nine, that's how we use them in agriculture. A good example is conservation farming, which many of you are very familiar with. Uh, this is in Zambia, and there the farmer, the woman there on the right is the farmer. She cuts down the maize, 
when it's uh, mature, she lays it on the ground, so it rots into the ground, and then, uh, in this case, her husband comes along and he digs the little holes to put the seed in. And ideally, with conservation farming, you do that, and then you follow it with keeping that uh, cover of the maize stalks on the ground for a period, and then you usually rotate it, preferably with a, with a legume. It's a brilliant way of doing things, and it's catching on quite fast now in Africa. The other is agroforestry, and this is a rather special example. Uh, the trees are uh, phytherbia, or it's a, a form of um, acacia, and um, they have the curious habit of shedding their leaves in the, w in the wet season. And under those bare-leafed trees, the maize there is producing three tons per hectare without any fertilizer because of the uh, nitrogens coming down with the leaves onto the ground. And they can sequester up to, up to 10 tons of carbon per hectare under those agroforestry systems. And then there's genetics. We talk about sustainable genetics. It's the same principle. You try and pack more things into what you're doing. And in this case, it's packing in more genes, whether you do it through uh, natural selection or for artificial selection, or you do it through, through some form of, of biofortification or whatever. They, what the picture there is one that I think you all know. That's the, the results of Monty Jones's work with the new rices for Africa. I often show those in Africa, and the African boys say, what are those boys doing in an Asian rice field? And I say, no, it's not. It's an African rice field. And then there are lots of ways of breeding into the future. Orange fresh sweet potato, and there's, I can see at least two of the pioneers of orange flesh, flesh sweet potato here in the audience, uh, done without GM, but done brilliantly by the teams there. Uh, in the middle is, is, is golden rice, which everybody knows about. It was funded originally by the Rockefeller Foundation when I was there. It's got to the stage now where the amounts of vitamin A in the golden rice are really very high. Uh, I think it's going to be commercialized in Bangladesh next year. Got close to that. But another example is what happens in Uganda. Uganda is the pioneer of genetically modified crops in Africa. They've got about 15 growing on a field scale. The one on the right there is against wilt disease. You can see what wilt disease does to a banana. And the bottom picture there is of GM uh, bananas. What is important about that is that it's all funded by government. It's funded by the British government, it's funded by the American government, and it's funded by the Ugandan government. And President Museveni is very, very keen on all this happening. And then this intensification of socioeconomics. One of the most important things are the links between farmers, particularly within farmer associations and savings and loans associations. But perhaps even more significant is getting farmers linked into value chains. Value chains here go all the way up from the research at the bottom to the markets at the top. You can actually draw the value chains, if you like, from a plant molecule to a human molecule. This is a, an extraordinary way, first of all, of organizing your knowledge about what's going on. It's also extraordinary because it forces you to think about how you add value along the way. And it's a way in which farmers literally can get involved in markets and capture some of the value for themselves. It's partly about inputs. The top left there is my grandfather. He ran a little co-op in Kent selling seed around the farms. Uh, bottom right there is sort of his descendant, not real descendant, but sort of figurative descendant, a woman running a little agro-dealers in a shop, I think, in Tanzania. Also, at that stage in the value chain, are 
are youthful entrepreneurs. This is a good example, young boys in Kampala who've learned how to make uh, cob shellers and they make these cob shellers, they sell them or they lease them or they carry them from village to village and get them to do the work. That kind of thing is what young African boys like to do. We just need much, much, much more of it. Uh, food processors are also important. This is the beginning of food processing. I saw it in Thailand many years ago, where it's snacks that are the first thing that uh, you get onto the market from the farms. In this case, they're making snacks in Uganda. And beyond that, it builds up into a larger uh, food processing activity. And now, just the last two slides. This is where I'm at now. Um, in about... Uh, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, uh, I created something called the Montpellier Panel. We were funded by the Gates Foundation. And the idea was to start to write about all these issues around agriculture in Africa in a fairly straightforward way that would be accessible to government leaders. And we wrote these, there's one there on soils, there's one on climate change, there's one in French on Rwanda, sustainable intensification, resilience, and so on. There's a, if you go on that particular web, look at Montpellier panel, you'll find there's about 15, 20 of those reports. And they're written in a way that makes it very accessible. You know, you, you always have to remember about the people you need to influence, which are government ministers, maybe even prime ministers or presidents. And they've got a very short attention span. I mean, really short attention span. <laughs> and this is where the sort of, the elevator conversation that comes in. And I used to be chief scientist at Diffid, and I used to do this. I'd get hold of a minister in an elevator and I'd say something like that, bang, bang, bang. And he'd pick it up. I remember one of them said to me, um, he said to me, Gordon, he said, is there any country in the world that's developed without an agricultural base? I said, yes. He said, oh, yes, really? He said, what is it? I said, Singapore. <laughs> and that was enough. I mean, that was all I had to do. That was all I had to say, and, and the message got through. And then, um, uh, uh, three years ago, we, we, tr trans we morphed this panel into the Malibu Montpellier panel. Uh, it's got a, an African base. It's, the members of it are primarily Africans. It's based in Dakar in Senegal under the directorship of Usman Bajan. And uh, Usman and um, Joachim von Braun in Bonn are co-chairs. And I've got a unit at Imperial College as well. And we all work together to produce these new style reports. And we've got two out already, one called Nourished, another called Mechanized. The Nourished one is really quite interesting because, oh, I've got to stop. Don't want I'm stopping. <laughs> Um, the nourished one is interesting because we discovered that the way to reduce child mortality was to get a cross-departmental committee and make it um, responsive there. So, and there's one called Mechanise, the next one's on irrigation, and I'll stop there. <laughs> Sorry, I ran on too long. You know, I, I could speak for a very long time about Gordon Conway, but I won't, partly because some of the highlights of his career have been touched on by Ambassador Ken Quinn. Uh, but the most important thing I can say about him, his humanity, his commitment to a shared humanity, his passion, for the poor and compassion, his notion of dignity for the farmers came through in that speech. I mean, uh, Gordon is a guy who uh, spent a lot of time with ministers, heads of state, president of the Ford Foundation, vice chancellor of Sussex, uh, advisor to David, head of the, 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 uh, uh, the panel for the Montpellier panel and so on. But all his discussion, all his examples, 
or how to interact with the poorest farmers. And I think in that comes a lesson and a summation about a man of passion and compassion, a man of caring, and that certainly I believe that all of us can continue to learn lessons from you, Gordon. I will ask you about a number of things uh, because I think if there's one thing missing from this excellent presentation, it is the sense of urgency. Uh, those of us, including you, who have spent much time thinking about these issues will know that especially if you have been reading the reports on climate change, and if you have been reading the reports about demography in Africa. So I will give you four important points as a starting point of this discussion. The first of these is that it's going to be very, very hard to limit the negative impacts of climate change, even if we were able to keep the rise in average global temperature to below two degrees Celsius, which doesn't look likely under current trends. Uh, we have seen some of the enormous variability that will occur in that sense. Secondly, a terrible statistic. I was telling my friend uh, uh, Gibista about that. Uh, in May of this year, for the first time, the country with the largest number of very poor people, where Hungary is concentrated, is no longer India. It is now Nigeria. And that in itself is a momentous marker, despite the fact that Nigeria has oil and so on. Uh, thirdly, population projections for Sub-Saharan Africa uh, are enormously uh, frightening. Uh, the UN consensus position is that the population will quadruple from 1.1 billion in 2015 to 4.4 at the end of the century, while Asia will go up to 5.2 and then come down to 4.8. And uh, the IASA, which disagrees with the UN consensus forecast, forecasts a trebling from 1.1 to 3.3. And I said to my friends there, I said, look, I mean, even, yes, it's less than the UN figure, but it's devastating to go from 1.1 to 3.3 billion human beings in Africa is going to be devastating. Gordon mentioned the fourth statistic, which was very uh, powerful, which is the fact that uh, Africa imports $40 billion uh, worth of food today uh, with the current population level and with the current income levels. Now to that we must add that climate change, climate change is going to increase variability of rainfall, sequences of drought and flood, and, and, and here comes the difficult part, a very large proportion, over 90 plus percent, of African agriculture is not irrigated. So as a result, these are small scale rain-fed farming which are going to be subjected to an enormous fluctuation in rainfall and uh, will have cycles of rains and floods. So, what does that tell us? I think it tells us something that uh, a fellow Brit said extremely well, that there is a tide in the affairs of men which taken at the flood leads on to fortune, omitted all the voyage of their lives, is bound in shallows and in miseries, and on such a full sea are we now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. I think that applies to the threat and the challenge that is before these billions of small farmers, and that we all collectively here, who want to be uh, loyal to the tradition of uh, our friend and mentor, Norman Borlaug, have to figure ways in which science and outreach can be combined to reach out and uh, empower the farmers in Africa to take charge of their destiny. And uh, Gordon, since you have committed almost all of your life, and many of your books, not all, I have some more to talk about, what would you have to tell us 
about how to make science most effectively the servant of these small farmers in Africa. Huh. Uh, I mean, my problem is that I'm an optimist. <laughs> Naturally, of course, it's, it's probably genetic. That's why I um, go on working, because I believe we can have an effect. I think there are out there lots of really good stories of change. There are really big efforts to make a difference. I mean, one, for example, in China is that they are now got a major campaign to reduce the amount of fertilizers used in China and also to get on top of the pig waste. And if they do that effectively, they bring down the amount of greenhouse gas emissions in the world as a whole enormously. And that's a real plus. I think the, uh, the constraint of land in Africa is serious, but we are seeing now uh, growth of middle-sized farms. You're getting uh, quite a considerable number of farms of 5 to uh, 10, 20 hectares in, side, in size in, in Africa. Uh, and, for example, in Ghana, those middle-sized farms are producing as much food as all the small one-acre, one-hectare farms. Uh, I think what's important, uh, and when it comes to population, again, we know very well that the, the desire of Africans to have smaller families is there. The unmet demand is enormous for contraceptives. And it's not been helped by um, donor governments, who shall be nameless, who, who um, will not uh, provide those contraceptive devices. So there are a number of things that you can do and are being done, and there are good stories. And I think, the really, we were talking about this just before I came up here with Roger, who's a great storyteller. I can't see him now. He must be still there in the audience. Roger's a great storyteller. We need more of these stories, and they need to be told simply, and we need to persuade people that that's what's going to happen. Very good. So if we can... Uh, Sorry, it's a fireside chat. I should be seeing Yeah, you. no, no, that's all right. That's, uh, uh, it, the main thing is the ideas that you bring forward. And uh, it is compelling that we, we have responsibility to engage uh, the leaders as well as the entrepreneurs and the farmers, everybody in the value chain that you, you showed us. And uh, this, regretfully, is not going to be very easy uh, because uh, some of the leaders pay only lip service. Uh, some thoroughly reject everything about climate change. But uh, we can, I think, go a bit further. You have, in your career, done a lot in uh, supporting directly the development of uh, new varieties. If I remember correctly, uh, Narika, the, the rice, uh, the African rice, uh, you were at uh, the back of funding it when you headed the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, and uh, uh, you also, uh, when you were there, in fact, launched two other major programs, one with uh, Secretary General Kofi Annan on post-Rwanda reconstruction, and that is important. We have uh, the Congo, we have southern Sudan, we have many other places in Africa where conflict is causing the primary problems. And we heard the panel on this yesterday. And uh, you also dealt with issues of health, including how to reach pregnant mothers uh, to have HIV-free babies. So uh, in being able to do all that, do you have any particular preference as to where the entry point might be for a new program to support the well, situation? I've, I've been visiting Rwanda nearly every year for, I don't know, from soon after the genocide. And the progress in, in, in Rwanda is enormous. And there's no doubt about that. You can see it all around. And you can see in particular young entrepreneurs, even if they're only driving little motorcycle taxis, there's lots of them going on. There are still human rights abuses, of course, in, in uh, Rwanda. But the change there is one that we could all learn from. The, the story about um, HIV is an interesting one. Kofi Annan asked me, as the Rockefeller Foundation, would I give some money to, the, to his big uh, 
fund to combat HIV. And I said, no, no, we're a foundation. We don't just do that kind of thing. We like to be a pioneer in some way. And so we came up with the notion of trying out giving antiretrovirals to pregnant women before they gave birth. And lo and behold, and we raised uh, $100 million from different foundations in a group, and lo and behold, when you do that, none of the babies have HIV. And of course, that was a time when people were saying, oh, HIV is a lifestyle disease. I used to get so mad at that thought. The notion that these little babies had got the wrong lifestyle and that's why they'd got AIDS was just dreadful. But we were able to demonstrate that, and that's something I think I'm always very proud of, that we did that work. Well, actually, uh, uh, I'm very, you should be also very proud of the, the post-Rwanda work that uh, you did. In fact, many people here should be very proud, and I'll remind you with a small story. And uh, Gordon was involved with me at the time in the CGIAR. Uh, in the genocide in Rwanda, practically everybody who had been involved with agricultural research was killed. Uh, the stores were looted, the labs were destroyed, uh, etc. And it was the scientists of the CGIR who through a program called Seeds of Hope were able to get from the seed collections the right seeds for each region of Rwanda and multiplied those seeds and sent people to work with the farmers in each of those areas to get agricultural production restarted uh, after that. And to me, that was always one of the great uh, uh, examples of how scientists, many of whom are here from the CGIR, were devoted in their common humanity with people and brought science to bear on the basic ability to have food grow again after a genocide. I think that's great. And it's interesting, uh, Raj Shah has become the new uh, president of the Rockefeller Foundation. And I saw him last week, and he's absolutely adamant that the Rockefeller Foundation is now going to be a science and technology-based organization dealing with the big issues around health, and around agriculture, and so on. And I think that's fantastic to have that happen again. Indeed. Now, let me ask you a question, because one of the things that comes out from your presentation is, in fact, that you need many disciplines uh, to deal with an issue. And multidisciplinarity uh, is, as you have said yourself, uh, is not something that administrations normally like, whether at universities or elsewhere. And you have yourself, uh, when you were in charge of the University of Sussex, uh, pushed multidisciplinarity. And in Imperial College, you have a, a Center for Environmental Technology and Policy, which brings together many disciplines. Question, is it better to have a group of people who are narrow specialists, but working together and thereby bringing all the disciplines together, or to have someone trained to a lesser degree in all the disciplines? No, I think you've got to have the structures that allow people to work together. I mean, the problem is that multidisciplinarity is what governments like to mouth about but they don't support it. Sussex was a good example uh, of, of the multidisciplinarity. Uh, it, it was built into the system. Uh, unfortunately, after I left, the bureaucrats said it's too complicated to manage. And so it's died away. But I think we need to continue to fight for, for multidisciplinarity. Indeed. Well, that's very important because I think uh, uh, there is now an increasing uh, possibility of ha having uh, specialists unified at particular platforms, uh, one of which you give an example of in the conceptual model in which each person may be a specialist in one part of it, another being, of course, now increasingly the mathematical models that uh, are being dealt with in very large-scale uh, computing facilities. But the third and most important is really on the ground, where, uh, I mean, uh, to use another expression, it's uh, where the rubber hits the road, as they say, 
uh, this is where whatever you've been doing in the lab and uh, with the computers has to be translated into uh, reality. And that requires uh, actually uh, another skill which is seldom mentioned and that which you showed so gracefully in your presentation that perhaps it didn't come across enough, which is to have the quality of diplomacy that enables you to deal uh, with the heads of state all the way down to the local farmer and the genuine caring that is there. Now, that is, I would believe, best developed by on the field training, wouldn't you say? Yeah. You've had your own career was... Uh, well, I, th I, th think, I think all scientists, even if, if they become lab scientists, need to be, spend part of their time learning how to live and work in villages with poor farmers. It's the same with doctors. The people who eventually do become specialists and heart surgeons and all the rest, and I love heart surgeons because I've got a nice one here, uh, working away at the moment, they all need to have that time on the ground talking to individual patients about their ailments. And I don't see any reason why you, we did at Sussex uh, create a new medical school where right from day one the, the trainee doctors were out in doctor surgeries in clinics and learning how to do it. Before then you get a degree in medicine and then they'd say okay now you can go and treat patients and you'd walk into the room and you'd say my god what can I do? This is awful having to deal with all these people and so you need to build that into the training programs. Well, now I, I think we are all very proud of the fact that the World Food Prize uh, is engaged with the Borlaug Youth Institutes and uh, that our friend Luis Fresco has started one in Europe as well and that we now have uh, uh, cadres of young people going out for their training and being exposed to some of these, of these issues. Now let me be very nasty and ask you a question. How do you ensure that uh, this doesn't uh, turn, in terms of academic preparation, and you were a vice chancellor, that this doesn't turn into a soft option in terms of the career, academic career that involves uh, uh, developmental tourism and not enough rigor. Uh, so how do you do that? How, how would you hold up the standard to make sure that well, this happens? You have happens? to make sure that academics are judged on a number of criteria, of course, one of which is they have to be judged on their academic publications. But secondly, they can be judged on their more popular pu uh, uh, publications. And thirdly, they need to be judged on their impact in terms of, of uh, individual having uh, ways of, of, of working out there in the community. And in fact, in the, under the new British system, which is just coming in, all three of those strands are going to be there, and we're going to be judged on all three of those, and I think that's what's important. Now, let me ask a question about something that you have not mentioned at all, and which probably hardly anybody in the audience knows about Gordon. Uh, at one point in his career, uh, he was put in charge of a, a very important and sensitive panel for the UK, and uh, in which he coined the word Islamophobia. And the notion was how to get communities uh, of diverse backgrounds in the UK get together. Now, to this day, that report stands as a beacon, uh, especially in these days where we see the tensions in Europe, when we see the problems of immigration, when we see tensions in the US, uh, that Gordon was the leader of an effort, how many years ago? <laughs> Uh, 20 years ago, uh, that came up with a report for the UK government, and he labeled the report at his own insistence it should be Islamophobia. So tell us a word about that. Yeah, it was, it was an exciting development. I had a, to begin with, I said, no, I can't do this. And it was a very persuasive woman who, who said, yes, you can. And I said, but I'm not an expert in race relations. And she said, but you've, you've worked in a whole lot of, uh, of countries 
You've worked in, 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 for example, in Pakistan, you've worked in Indonesia, you've worked in Bangladesh, a lot of countries that have large Muslim populations. And you know what it's like to work side by side with people of that faith. I said, yes, that's true. And so that was the basis for what we did. We, I think we did make a difference at that time about British attitudes towards Muslims in Britain. A lot of it has been... Uh, uh, transformed by more recent events. But even now, there are still pushbacks in saying, let's, when we talk about what's going on here, when we talk about people who are, for example, terrorists, let's be quite careful how we label those, that terrorism. Is that terrorism a result of Islam? Is it a terrorism result of Muslims? Is it a terrorism of extremists who are exploiting that that activity. And I remember going back to you, one of your books you produced was about the origins of Sharia law. And we all think that Sharia law is, a, is, is, is not a very good thing. But in fact, the way it was written it originally, one of the th things that the Sharia law did was to say that people were innocent until proven guilty. And that was a very important statement. And we have to keep remembering that actually if you go back in history, in all our communities, there are really strong undercurrents of more liberal democratic uh, uh, lifestyles which have been undermined in more recent years. And we need to get back those liberal democratic lifestyles for ourselves. Indeed, Indeed. and it just shows that uh, Gordon Conway, the scientist, Gordon Conway, the development specialist, Gordon Conway, the educator, Gordon Conway, the head of foundation, the advisor to governments, and the man who reaches to uh, the smallest farmers and ensures their dignity and empowerment is also a citizen uh, who uh, adopts a philosophy and acts on it. And that, incidentally, to come back to the Africa challenge is going to be very serious because, as you know, we have tribal uh, and ethnic and religious warfare throughout Africa, and some of the panels that discussed the problem of conflict and hunger are important together. Now, uh, I could, as I said, we could continue to speak uh, forever, but we won't. I will be wrapping this up now. And before I, I wrap up, I would like to ask you if there's one more thing that you would like to add to uh, this session before I say my closing benedictory for you. I think if I decide I'm going to say one more thing, I think that... The well, let, let's say that in some ways the obvious thing. I've greatly enjoyed being a member of the Council of Advisors of the World Food Prize. I've enjoyed every year coming here to Des Moines and interacting. I see lots of faces in the audience of people I've known. And I've done business with. There's lots of business gets done at this place. Lots of fund, funds being raised, and I'm about to do that with somebody in the next couple of years, days. <laughs> I won't name who it is, but that has been rewarding and I'd like to thank you all so much for all that you've uh, done for me uh, and, and so much pleasure from coming here to Des Moines into this wonderful account and in particular from all the inspiration over there <laughs> from Ken, from Ken Quinn, who's just been a fantastic leader of all of this. Yes. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Yeah. No, no, no. This is the applause to Ken. This is the applause to Ken. And that I have to Gordon. Wait. wait. I, uh, I want to say something about Gordon, myself, and the others who are growing older. And we are all very inspired by the young people who are here and the built-in mechanism which Ken has so artfully worked whereby there is this intergenerational link. So I say on behalf of the old, uh, don't look very old, but years may wrinkle the skin but to give up our ideals would wrinkle our soul. And the years we mark our face, diminish our physical vigor, uh, whiten our hair or lose our hair completely, limit our eyesight, but we can remain young at heart. And you are. You are as young as your faith and as old as your doubt. 
as young as your dreams and as old as your cynicism, as young as your self-confidence and as old as your fear, as young as your hope and as old as your despair. And you will remain young as long as you believe in the beauty of your dreams and you believe in hope, sheer, and courage. Only if you give in to pessimism and lose your heart to cynicism, then and then only are you grown old. And then indeed, as Douglas MacArthur said, you just fade away. But we are all the not so young in this audience, I believe, are young at heart, and we can take pride in the example of the one and only Gordon Conway. Wonderful. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.